So part two of the B2 series, so we are um, again in the clinical data integration session and my next speaker is Rafael from Genialis and he, um, he will tell us about great cool tools that his company is building. Um, please welcome Rafael. Thanks for having me. This has been a real treat. Uh, I have three goals for this morning's talk. The first is just to introduce Genialis and our vision and our software to the Transmart community. We're relative newcomers uh, to Transmart and to um, translational research in general. My second goal is to open a discussion with individual members of the community about ways that our software may be able to help you immediately, or at least in the near future, in dealing with a number of the data analytics uh, issues you might face around uh, preclinical, pre-translational -trans research in your institutions. And the last is to um, continue a dialogue about some of the technology challenges that we have either solved or are actively tackling that are common to all of us. Uh, we've got a, a large open source code repository around most of our tools, and uh, this might be useful, or at least we can um, swap war stories and think if we can find good solutions. So we've identified a, a handful of challenges that you all are probably all too familiar with. Um, we're very much invested in what Ramon yesterday described as this usability issue. So we are you know, just doggedly focused on the end user, non-computationalists non especially. I'm a biologist by training. Um, I think I could find the command line on my computer, but it wouldn't be pretty. But we still have a, a platform now that addresses sort of four key problem areas. One is data management. Another is analytics, so doing the actual bioinformatics. A third, and this is, gets to the end user issue, is letting biologists, letting clinicians actually get in, roll up their sleeves, play with their data, follow their curiosities to logical conclusions, and ultimately come up with new hypotheses that can either be tested in silico at the lab bench or, or in the clinic. And lastly, uh, we all need to share our results. We need to share our data. And so we have some interesting uh, ways around um, publishing data, around permissions management, uh, and hopefully with the connectivity of our platform and others, um, we can make it easier to move data uh, in between them. So uh, we tackle these sort of four areas by um, adding value both for life scientists, end users, and for, for data experts and bioinformaticians. Uh, and I'm going to talk about both of those um, today. First is we think we have a really uh, lovely paradigm for how to actually do data visualization. And this is just a, a screen grab from our 3.0 um, web application. I'm really excited. We're actively rolling out the 3.0 web app now. Um, we've shipped to our first customer about two weeks ago, to our first paying customer. Many of the, the visualization tools are in uh, beta. Some are in alpha, and some are actually still on the development roadmap. And so I'd like to be really upfront about what we have working and what we have sort of rolling off the pipe in the next um, months or two. We work on about a, a two-month release cycle. Um, so the, the updates come rather frequently. Uh, do we have a pointer by any chance, or should I just walk over? You know, um, I do. I'll just, uh, I can use my cursor. I don't know if this it's fine. is a so let me just very quickly give you some orientation, because I'm going to go through a use case of our, our front-end visualization. So I want to give you some orientation. Along the uh, right-hand panel, and you can follow my cursor, are four icons. And these indicate pages. That's sort of the highest level of organization within the, the user interface. The top icon is for data acquisition and annota annotation. The second icon is for search. The third icon, which we're currently on, is for visualizations. And the fourth icon is for the bioinformatics dashboard, which is a um, relatively straightforward user interface for click and play bioinformatics. And then across the top, we've got tabs. So you'll read sample comparison, gene expressions, gene sets is highlighted, and so forth. Each of these tabs is, uh, comprises a workflow like this. Each tab, we call them views. Each view has a handful of modules. And the modules are meant to allow a user to accomplish a subset of tasks. And we work really hard to configure these modules and configure each workflow to solve the certain problem, particular questions that individual end users might have. So we'll work with your institution, with your lab group, to figure out what are the kind of routine analyses your biologists like to do, and we encapsulate those in the workflows. Um, there are five shown here. Uh, that's entirely configurable. You could have three. You could have six. Um, you'll notice out on the far right is time courses. Uh, we do support uh, a really neat time course analysis, which I'm not showing today, but I can talk about at the end uh, just conceptually how we do it. Um, and each of these modules is 
entirely interactive. So this is uh, TypeScript, AngularJS, uh, it's material design framework. It's really nice to see that, that the community is kind of adopting these visualization standards. Yesterday, Case showed a really nice slide of a web app they've built that looked quite similar. Um, Ibrahim showed uh, some of their software, which also has a, a similar look and feel. So this is all being built on sort of the, the state-of-the-art, you know, Google-dictated uh, standards for, for nice web design. Um, all of the modules are interactive and interconnected. So you can click on one and your selections on one propagate to the other. This lets a biologist, you know, scratch that itch. They want to know what's in this intersection of this Venn diagram and they get a heat map that corresponds to that. They find some genes that are especially interested, interesting to them and they want to take them and do a deep dive in gene expression so they can just push them from one view to the next and uh, sort of follow their, their curiosity to its logical conclusion. We also have two ways for bioinformaticians to interact with the software. The first is at a command line. We've built a powerful Python SDK, so this is a full software developer kit. Um, we're also working on an R API, um, which will probably morph into an SDK as it matures. Uh, and so from the command line, a data expert, a lab manager uh, with programming skills, et cetera, can manage all aspects of data management and analysis. They can set permission settings. Permissions can be set as high level as you know, this user has read and write on all data. It can also be set on every single data object individually, so it can be quite granular for sharing data or allowing access uh, among collaborators. And at the bottom is a, a screenshot of our bioinformatics dashboard. We have over 200 open source algorithms and tools baked in, and it's rather straightforward. Uh, if you've developed things in-house or there are other community standards we don't include in our shipment to simply wrap those as a process. Um, the bioinformatics dashboard allows you to essentially create pipelines by clicking on uh, one tool saying send the output from that to another it's, and so forth. Um, and I'll come back to the, the developer tools uh, the second half of the talk. So let's walk through a little uh, just a use case. Um, the data that I'm showing you, some of it is real, some of it is stylized for the sake of this presentation just to show you some of the inner functionality. When a user enters the software, typically this is where he or she will start. This is the acquisition and data annotation page. And our favorite way of engaging users is to link directly to their sequencing machine. So the data literally comes right onto the platform from the sequencer. Uh, it doesn't pass go and it doesn't collect $200. They get to work with the data immediately. Uh, but we put a neat little stop in place. A user can't actually run an analysis unless they've fully annotated their data. Now, they can annotate the data before it's ready. So if you're sending off a bunch of samples to your sequencing core, you can create annotation pages or do a bulk upload of annotation pages for each of those samples such that when the data arrives, these primary analyses are triggered to run automatically. And we support uh, all number of annotation forms. I was really inspired by Ibrahim's talk yesterday and I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring the eTrix uh, project in much greater detail. But for example, we support a standard geo uh, forms, SRA forms. But we've also worked with clients who have their own internal or community standards where they want literally hundreds if not thousands of different uh, annotation fields. We typically don't do that from the user interface. We'll typically do that from the command line because it's just easier to work in bulk. Um, but everything you see here is, is fairly straightforward to uh, format and configure for a particular use case. So once uh, the annotations and data hit, the, the analyses start running and the user can go to their uh, search to find the data they want. So here I've got a stylized data set that I'm attributing to Keith. I don't think this was his, but um, I thought that would be, that'd be fun to pretend it was. And so what you can see on the, the right side panel, uh, users can search, and this is an elastic search paradigm, they can search either by sample, so that would be a patient or a cell or, or you know, uh, a test tube, or by collection. So a collection might be a published study or it might be uh, an ad hoc grouping of samples from across studies. Uh, they can also search from internal data or from geo or from transmart. For example, we've built a, a connector that uses the Transmart um, API. And so they can find the data they want, uh, and it populates into a nice um, uh, search output table. If you search by collection, you get the sort of Google-like output. If you search by sample, you get something like this, where you actually have parameters. And, and these columns are configurable, so you can sort of figure out what are the, I don't know, six or eight uh, clinical parameters that are actually most useful for us finding the data we want, and those can be displayed as column headers. Uh, you can also enter in the search box, you can f search by um, clinical parameter and uh, that allows you to add a layer of filtering. You'll note on the previous slide there are additional filters. The filters are also entirely configurable. So again, if you know, there are 1,500 clinical parameters but there are six or eight or 
150 that you like to use the most, we can set it up. And so the look and feel, rather than feeling like you're in a Windows 95 directory tree architecture, is much more like you're shopping on Amazon or in some sort of modern web framework uh, where you can you know, select the color shoe you want and the size and the style. So then the user may go to visualizations, and we, we typically start with things like sample comparison, uh, just something to help a user wrap their mind around the high-dimensional data. And so a user might run something like PCA or sample uh, hierarchical clustering. Um, with the PCA plot in particular, we also have a scree plot so you can investigate what genes are driving <clears throat> the variation described by PC1 or PC2. Uh, and then we have color by features where the user can color by any number of clinical parameters. And uh, those can be ranked um, either alphabetically or by a correlation score. So you can just color it by which clinical parameters statistically most uh, correlated with the spread you see along PC1, and you might get some sort of uh, idea of how the data are actually mm -hmm. clustering. We also support a shape annotation feature. So a user could layer a second level of information like gender or, or age or something like this. Um, so in our use case, uh, uh, let's say Keith is, is examining his data and he sees, okay, well, clearly there's a group of um, high physical activity patients over on the right, and there's a group of low physical activity patients on the left, and there's some guys in between. And so maybe his next question is, you know, what are the differential gene expressions that are driving this kind of variation? So what genes are actually responding differently? And so he navigates to the differential expression tab and can actually set up a new differential expression analysis on the fly where he filters by the clinical parameter he wants to stratify the groups um, and saves and selects and it pings back to the server and runs. Um, the data will become available when the analysis is done and it can be viewed in a traditional volcano plot. So then maybe he types in the gene he's most interested in. So in this case is MECP2. Uh, MECP2 has been implicated in, in Rett syndrome among other neuro neurological diseases. Uh, specifically, duplication and overexpression of MECP2 seems to be a disease driver. And so sure enough, it's enriched in the low physical activity, which corresponds with uh, worse prognoses. So then he takes uh, his mouse and he draws a box around the top quadrant of differentially expressed genes. So we support clicking on these graphs. We also support brush and box as a way of interacting with the data. He selects his box and it tells you which genes are in that box and you can save a new gene set. Uh, you can push these into the gene info module if you want to explore external links or some brief descriptions or if you want to move them to um, other views. So he takes his new gene set uh, and he's going to look at this now in the context of other data he's generated elsewhere. Um, we don't currently support uh, a routine data harmonization step. So comparing the actual expression values that you grab in from Transmart, you would have to run some algorithms on those, but you could, you know, you could obviously do that uh, to compare it to some other data. But certainly at the abstract level of a gene set, of a gene list, you know, these are my biomarkers, um, you can compare data sets. So here, uh, the large um, orange box, or orange circle rather, is uh, a, data, a gene set of genes that are differentially expressed in mouse MEPC, MECP2 model, uh, the green Circle is a list from the literature. Maybe this lab published it previously or from another lab, gold standards in the field. And the blue circle is, is Keith's new gene list. And he wants to figure out, you know, which genes are in common between these different, you know, experiments. We have patients, we have mice, we have, you know, a literature study or possibly a cell line. And so he makes a selection. Immediately he gets some gene ontology enrichment information. We're also developing a module that allows um, ingenuity pathway analysis subscribers to subscribe, you know, to log in, and they can pull out um, IPA data directly into this app. So you don't have to leave the app to get that information. Um, can you give me a high sign when I'm running low? Sure. So he has his new gene set, his, his 15 genes that intersect here, and he wants to do a deep dive. He wants to understand how do these genes behave in some other experimental context. So he can go to the gene expressions view. And here, uh, he's loaded a bookmark. So the state of the analysis at any point can be saved as a bookmark. This bookmark can be emailed to your friend, to your boss. Um, it can also just be retrieved uh, at a later date. So here, he's gone up to the bookmark uh, button, and he's loaded a little pilot experiment uh, they're doing in the lab with um, five biological replicates of uh, neurologically, um, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, embryonic stem cells that have been uh, set for a neurological fate, and half of them are dosed with some drug, and the other half are placebo, and he wants to look and see which genes actually respond to the drug out of his 15. And so this is, again, uh, a stylized use case, but it's meant to illustrate how you can start with data in an external source, especially a place like Transmart, um, that would be relevant to this group, 
do some analyses, and then very quickly relate the insights or the, the discoveries you make in that data set to lots of other data sets within your organization, within your lab, uh, and, and find kind of deeper meaning in the data in this way. So what's running underneath the hood, though, to let all these cool things happen? So this uh, big green box is a nice abstract way of saying we've got a, a data flow engine that's built on the Django uh, web framework. Um, it uses lots of cutting edge technologies, MongoDB. Um, all of our bioinformatics processes run in Docker images. So everything is version controlled, dependency controlled, and uh, the, the provenance of every single analysis um, can be looked up either from the command line or within the user interface. If you click on any single sample that's been processed on our platform, you get a, a sub page that actually lists a step by step uh, history of the analyses run on that sample. So there's no sort of black box about what's been done to any individual sample. This is all open source. Um, there's a link here. I'm happy to share it uh, later as well if you want to read the documentation or uh, download the libraries uh, to play with. And we have lots of ways of connecting. So we've got a RESTful API. You can connect through a Python, soon through our, um, our entire visual application layer which is not open source yet, but that's uh, up for discussion, um, connects through a JavaScript API. But essentially, you could build apps or integrate existing web apps into, um, into this data flow engine. Um, we also have a connector to Orange. Uh, AJ mentioned Orange as a data mining software suite. Um, our company actually grew out of the lab that invented and maintains Orange, so we're tight with those guys if you want to do additional data mining. This is a little bit... Um, finer grain of how uh, Resolve, the, the data flow engine, actually works. But again, the idea is that we have a workload manager so we can support high-performance high computing, uh, distributed computing, where each analysis would then be put on a different core. Um, and we support local, uh, local workload managers, Celery, Slurm, and you know, can write connectors to LCF or whatever the, the workload manager might be. And again, this is all done um, in a Docker image. We can run pipelines of any kind. So we use YAML wrappers for the bioinformatics pipelines and processes. If your pipelines are all in R, that's fine. If, you can, if they're in Python, that's fine. As long as you can call it from a bash script, you can wrap it in our YAML wrappers and run them. Uh, so bringing your existing pipelines um, into the, the platform is fairly straightforward. Uh, we also have you know, dozens and dozens of our own that have already been validated on some data. This is just a very short list. You can go to the website to see the, the longer list of um, uh, some of our uh, bioinformatics uh, tools, um, lots of the standard you know, open source stuff. Um, I actually think this link is wrong, but I'll send you the right link uh, afterwards. And there's also documentation and a tutorial on how to get started with the, uh, the SDK, the Python SDK. And so again, we've built out these developer tools and these data expert tools because our system only works if there's a tight collaboration between the data scientists and the biologists. Now, in some cases, we fill that role of data scientists for our clients, um, but having been at this meeting, I see that, that there are many dedicated and, and incredibly smart and, and talented people working on this. So the idea is that with some investment on the end of the data scientist to wrap some pipelines and to get data in the right place, uh, the biologists can enjoy a level of autonomy in their data exploration that's really hard to find in other solutions. And so we think that, that our platform really helps both parties play to their strengths. The biologists can use their artistry and their intuition, and the data scientists can frankly go back to doing data science rather than you know, rerunning the exact same scripts um, in some kind of uncontrolled way because new data came in. We uh, have built our system to be modular. So the idea is that we want it to be able to connect to other systems in lab groups. Um, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel and we're not trying to displace uh, solutions that are working. We want to connect them and make the data work better. Um, you, you probably wouldn't be surprised how often we, we talk to clients who have a dozen web apps, each of which has its own data warehouse or its own data silo, and they're not getting the most out of it. Plus, they have to have 12 different people managing their, their software instead of um, one or two. Uh, we work very closely with groups that develop ontologies and taxonomies to make sure that the, the data curation happens according to standards, although that's an area I think we really could um, find uh, purpose to collaborate on. And furthermore, we try to connect to knowledge bases uh, where that's, that's uh, necessary. So I'm really interested in taking questions and also in suggestions for how we might find a, a home in the Transmart community. 
Um, we're really impressed by the work that's already uh, gone on, but see real value in, in helping people access not only their clinical data, but making sense of it in light of everything else going on in the lab. Thank you. Thank you.